Welcome to Real Talk Christian Podcast, where we drink coffee and have real conversations on faith, culture, and society. This is Mark Hyde. And Chris Fuller. And on today's episode of Real Talk Christian, we're talking about communion. You might know it as the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, but either way, what is communion? What has been the differences over history? And does it even matter to your faith today? Fuller, you ready? Let's go. What is up, Sir What's Fuller? Up, Mark, bro, I feel like we're in a weird space today. We we have been officially kicked out, kicked out of the studio, kicked out of the studio for good, for good. We, we're we're studio list right now. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's my bad. That's I mean, someone had well, to find a find a lady and move. It's not. Oh, all, sorry, sorry, not move first, but find a lady, date, get married, and move, and do it in less than a year. But you know what? That's all right. It's worth it. So it, it's it is and worth it. I think it. our listeners would agree. Marriage is bliss. Marriage is bliss. <laughs> For all you single people out there who are still single, you're not broken. No. You, you just got to find somebody. But either way, we are actually at the church that we go to, We're Southside Baptist actually Church. the college student room. We are in this co- I mean, you can't Jagger, really tell. thank you for the nice decor. Yes, sir. So, um, I mean, all you can see is like the walls. This was the last project actually at the church. I fought yeah. for years to paint some walls. Yeah, it got done and then COVID happened. And then COVID <laughs> happened. No one saw this room. I, we painted the toddler room and no one saw it. Nope. Uh, we did a couple other small little things that nobody got to see. But so it's, it's nice in here, man. It's a vibe. Jagger's done a good job with the vibe. But yes. so if you're watching on YouTube, it looks completely different. No it fireplace. Does. And no. we're against just a gray wall with uh, some lights behind and us. And maybe one day we'll find a new home. Because <laughs> we are homeless. We are officially podcast homeless. Yes. Yes. It's kind of sad, actually. <laughs> we had a lot of good memories at that house. We did. Okay, so... We have podcasted in three different rooms at my house. We migrated a lot. We did. We did. We started in your living, your great living room. The big room, yep. Then the family room. Yep, which became my office. And then we went out to the three seasons. Kind, of, It's kind of four seasons. Yeah, we just left the heater running 24-7. Yeah. yeah. It was nice. With the fireplace, the fireplace and the table. That's, that's where we started the YouTube portion. That, that was. That was also because I think the last episode we did in that front room was like the New Year's Eve ep- or New Year's episode and Christmas episodes of 2019 and 20. Right. Yeah. That might be the last time we were in that front room. But people don't know because wow. if you watch us on YouTube, we've always been in the same place. Or if you listen to us audio, you're like, I don't really care what room you guys are in, Mark we, and Ford. We don't, we don't care. We just want to hear the good audio we don't care. experience. Let's so, see here. Let's see here. I'm, I'm what gonna, are, you, are you going through your camera roll right now? Yeah, uh, just, 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 just chill. But either way, so while, while you're going through... Oh, wait. What are you doing? So... We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> little sneak preview for our listeners. Oh, what are we doing? So we're gonna do a Facebook Live, man. We're gonna do Facebook Live. Why but, not? But I don't want to waste time with the banter if we're going Facebook Live. Well, I mean, I but gotta, either way. So long story short, yeah, I sold my or I'm, I'm, right now, date of record, I'm selling my house, and we got kicked out of the room because I had to paint the ceilings and paint the walls and all right. that kind of stuff. So are we Facebook Live right now? We, we are Facebook Live on RTC. Right now, on they RTC. don't see anybody. What's up, Facebook world? We're well, in a new space. We are. This is the uh, church uh, college room here. Jagger. Well, those are lights. Those are well, lights. Yeah. Jagger, you did a nice job, my friend. Uh, very, very classy. We're drinking some good stuff we right are, now. Let's talk about the coffee we're drinking while we're on Facebook let's, Live. Let's, let's talk about it. Because we can show Facebook. So here's what we're drinking tonight, Facebook family. Panther. YouTube family, if you can see it. Panther. This is called Panther Coffee. So for Valentine's Day, Beth got me a trade coffee subscription where every single month, they send me a bag of coffee based on my taste preferences. So I got two bags the first month. This is one of those bags. So it's from oh. a place in Florida. And this is from a small little farm in Brazil. And they micro roast everything. And what did you think? I mean, it says chocolate eclair, hazelnut, creamy, sweet, and round flavors. It's, it's yellow bourbon. What, is it, what does yellow bourbon mean? Is that where it was stored in the I'm, beans? I'm guessing they stored it in a bourbon barrel. I don't, I don't know. I'm not really 100% I don't, sure. I don't really know. So uh, I know that... Um, it's very low acidity. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have that big body flavor, but no. it's good. It it doesn't punch you, and it's it's very much a, a light medium roast mm-hmm. somewhere in there. But it's and it's, it's one where I topped this off. I I feel like it tasted better before I topped it off. Yeah, it's been sitting in that French press for a little oh, bit as yeah. we were chatting. Oh. So it's I mean it would probably would be able to extract more of the flavors and the um 
the body of it if we did like fine grind espresso oh. or do like a mocha pot with it. That'd be pretty cool. It'd probably be really good. Right. Um, French it just, press it's is just all right. smooth. This, but this, so this Panther coffee, Brazil with chocolate eclair. I taste that. The hazelnut, I don't really taste that. But creamy, sweet, and round. I, I, I agree. I agree. It was cr- creamy, sweet, and round. Ooh. <laughs> I think I just so, described Fuller, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's uh, that's the Coffee Talk uh, Facebook Live. We're going to put you down so we can get back to the podcast. Bye, Facebook. We're going to catch you guys later. Bye. All right, now that that's done. <laughs> just Facebook, not Instagram. This is getting dropped like. This is just it, man. Six, like it's five just... weeks later. But either way, so that's the coffee we're drinking for tonight. We have it no is. new reviews to read. However, we have an a we have an apology to make. <laughs> yeah. So we have no new reviews, it's but all there was, my fault. There was a review left by um a, a wonderful individual. We don't Wait, know your name. Hang on, before we get into that. Oh, what? We got to do the question in a box. Are we still doing question in a box, dude? Let's do it. Okay, I just don't want to waste too much time because I'm excited about right. this topic. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do a real quick. Okay, uh, okay, okay, I'm ready. We're I'm gonna ready. Do a quick one. What have you done that's made a difference in lives around you? Um, I started a podcast. Done. <laughs> I was gonna say I dragged a mom and five girls from the warm Knoxville to the terrible cold South Bend. That kind of changes lives, yeah. <laughs> and we don't know if it's for the better yet, <laughs> dude. Everything that's bad, the the girls will be like. Ooh. The girls will be like, they'll make a comment about South Bend of just yeah. like, of the, like, oh, it's just that's South Bend. I'm like, no, that, what? That makes absolute no sense. So they blame a lot of like bad things, like out and about on just, oh, just South Bend. Mm. And it's like, what? Like, no, that's not how this works. But, but either way, so they are enjoying the snow, but yep, I dragged a well, mom no and girls, now, but. not anymore, but a mom and five girls from the warm Knoxville where today, date of recording, it was like mid 60s. It was not mid sixties in South Bend. Wow. Nope. No, it wasn't. So I would say that would be All right. it. One last quick question. Yes. Where were you on nine eleven two thousand? Oh, I was at Calumet Christian Oh Baptist back then. Calumet Baptist School in my classroom. And what was interesting was we were just outside of Chicago, northwest Indiana. Right. So they like it wasn't just a Oh, no, it happened. It was locked down. No, no, it went locked down. A lot of our parents worked in Chicago. Our teacher's husband was working in Chicago in one of the high rises. So it instantly went from all communication was shut down. So our teacher was freaking out. They rolled the TVs in and we were watching it. And we were worried for the next many, many, many weeks of will they hit Chicago? Right. Because in order to do it from certain areas, they could potentially were so close over the river our city could be where the planes were like would be ditched. Right. So there's a lot of fear. Mm. I was not in school. I mean, I was homeschooled, so homeschool. I was still sleeping when the first plane hit. Were you really? My sister and my mom were up watching the news. My dad was at work. And uh my sister ran downstairs, woke me up. It's like what, eight thirty or mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact times, but around eight thirty. School just started. So she woke me up. She's like, we're under attack. That's what she said. So 2001 was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I would have been 12. She was 13. And so I ran upstairs. That was, and we're was watching nine. and we're watching. And we're watching the coverage. And then, bam, there's the next plane. And it was like, holy cow. Mm-hmm. I remember we had a prayer meeting that night. Called all, a bunch of people from our church together to come in and pray for the country. And it was just, it was, yeah, it was a... It scary was time of we didn't know what was going to happen anywhere. Nope. I mean, we're smack dab here in, in South Bend, kind of between Chicago and Indianapolis. <laughs> so it's like, uh. I mean, granted, we, I mean, let's just be honest. We're in one of the safest places to be because we're central and not near a coast. Like, I know that was a one redeeming factor when that happened. Right. Exactly. So my dad kept talking about that. He goes, we're not on the coast. We're not on the coast. And mm. that's how he calmed his kids down is God's in control and we're not on the coast. So my, the, the place where my dad works and now I work. Um, it's a place that is, um, I can't really say who it is or what it is because yeah, 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 yeah. Because I've signed some paperwork that says I can't. So, <laughs> but, uh, they are, let's just say, um, it has to be locked down when situations like that happen because of who we are and what we do. Um, we had to be like that. My dad was locked in. Like they locked the gates. They locked everything up. They had everybody on standby. Like, so he couldn't even get home. Mm-mm. Yeah, it was crazy. So I remember it all because like, my dad came home. 
Yeah. Like, he was sent home from work. My dad couldn't come home from work. They, they wow. had it locked down until later on that evening, and then they finally said, all right, shift change. And everybody, they switched shifts, and then they locked the gates again. They locked it down again. Because they weren't sure. I mean, we don't know. Right. The, what, what we do there, I mean, we provide stuff that, <laughs> <laughs> yep. that everybody needs. So, anyways. But another thing that was kind of scary is because we had uh, Cook's nuclear power plant is in Michigan City. Oh, that's true. So, we didn't know if, like, they were going to hit that or hit whatever. I mean, so, because that would that would cause fallout in Chicago over here. I mean, there was all sorts of stuff. So, it was a scary time. Mm-hmm. Anyways. Wow, that went <laughs> deep really quick. What, what are we at? Oh, 11 minutes. Yeah, we're, Fantastic. we're about but the same so, time. So, I about started saying this, okay, but then so. I didn't get into it. But we have an apology to, mm-hmm. to issues. Mm-hmm. So, a handful of episodes ago, again, we oh, bash boy. record. So, we just got the email, like, yesterday. Sorry. There was a review from a individual, wonderful individual, by the name of Almond Eyes. A wonderful man. Their, yeah, it was not a lady. <laughs> it it was, was not a girl, like we said on the podcast. So, well, you didn't say. You said I'm not going to say. Oh, that's true. So I, and I said I have the moral high ground on this conversation. And, and I said, <laughs> what, <laughs> what kind of guy would go with Almond Eyes Joe? <laughs> and we got an email handle. that basically it's all like, I said was, I'm, "I'm a dude. I'm a dude," and I'm like. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said I just need to stop. We need to stop. We just with, need to stop. So if you leave genders. us a review, we will not guess your gender unless you specifically tell us. I guess <laughs> I don't even know. But either way, for all you guys who have left reviews out there, thank you. We just got a new shipment of buttons. Got shipped to my house actually, Ooh. so we got some new buttons because uh, they were on sale. They were yeah. they was on sale. So we got some new buttons. Didn't we have a giveaway? We did have the giveaway. The tote bag. The tote bag. That's right. That's right. But we have to wait till we don't know who won yet. Yeah, because the, the episode hasn't dropped It's like yet. in three weeks. So we're giving <laughs> stuff away all the time. But so it is springtime right now. So it's time to get that new merch. So I'm just going to throw it out there that hit the merch store up. People. Merch at www. Oh, wait. That's the chosen that's thing. That's the chosen. So, so <laughs> no, it's, but real talk, Rich podcast.com. Uh, honestly, face masks, at least in our area, the, like the mandate's still on. It ain't going For anywhere. Now, yeah. So you might as well get an RTC face mask or neck gator or neck to represent. Gator. Oh, dude, the neck gators are so wonderful. They are so great. They're comfortable. They're not overly tight. So I like mine, except <gasps> that it messes my hair up because it wraps around the back of my hair. Oh, see. So I got, I got the high and tight going on right now, so... It don't mess so up. So UI, my UI. Head. It's for you short haired people. And my sister in law loves it. And my brother in law, I got them both one. They both love it. Hmm. So they they love the I know Marissa, hair. she still wears her face mask all the time around yep. here, South Bend. Yep, she so does. she wears hers. So either way, go to the store, get your merch, get your face mask, get your neck gator, get your tote bag. Get your leggings, RTC leggings. <laughs> I still can't believe I put that out I there. I was like, it. yeah, let's throw leggings out it. there too. So if, if you, I, I don't know if they have pockets or not. You'll have to go and find out. But either way. I don't so, know, but they look, if I was a, if I was a girl. <laughs> you would get them. I would get them. But we do leggings. not want to see if they're wearing those. You know what we need to do? We need to do oh, a no. polo. Like a embroidered polo. Yeah. That'd be pretty dope. I'd wear that. I'd wear it too. I'd wear that. It'd be a, it, it'd be need, it would be, need to be a nice like Under Armour or Nike or something. It would be a you know good golf shirt. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like yeah. that. Maybe so, we'll get into that. So, so Anyways. far tonight, we talked a lot about coffee. Yeah. We've gone Facebook Live. We have. We've we talked about the merch. We talked, we talked about ourselves because we want the people to get to know us as we get to know them. Right. We've also had to make an apology. So now it's time to talk. About, I, think it's, I, I think we've hit all the... The, about, the ground it's rule basis. Time to talk about catechism of talk communion. about the catechism of communion. And if you stuck with around with us this long, a thank you. Um, <laughs> B, we're sorry, but so we're talking about communion tonight, and we and are. you might and this isn't like communion like fellowship. This is legitimately you might know it more as the Eucharist, L- Lord's Supper, or the Lord's Supper. Basically, yeah. for for us Protestants, it's the the time where. It's the place where we eat the little juice cup the little and juice the cracker. Cup and, and the COVID-friendly crap is nasty. That do not It's like styrofoam, good. dude. That was, okay, I had the... Like, I was like, the one time Baptist probably should offer wine is during COVID because you know it, it's going to kill germs on the way down. So, alcohol. <laughs> but either way, so... Um, but either way, great. you know, this is something that for myself growing up... I grew up Baptist, so I've been Baptist my whole life. Um, I know for you, you grew up in a... Non-de- different different type of strains where house but, church non denomination. But your communion was always the Baptistic style where we very it's, it's just the memorial. Very, well, the where guy, we just do this in remembrance of me. You just pop it, pop it, great. The 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 person that kind of led our group was 
uh, he went to seminary at a Baptist school. <laughs> he was a Baptist pastor, and then he decided to do a home church. So, so you, you guys had Baptistic <laughs> we, we did. stuff yeah, in your church. We definitely did. And most of non most non denom churches are Baptistic in their styles. Right. So you know, for for us who grew up in Protestantism, communion was one of those things where like once a quarter, once a month. Some churches every single week after the service, you spread the elements out. Mm. You know, you're supposed to all right, pray to God, forgive mm. your sins. Okay, you pray. This do remember to me. Pop, take your shot. Put it in the row in front of you, and then you sing a song and you leave. You make it sound that's so what I unromantic. As a kid. That's what I, but that's, I'm, I'm, I'm talking the kid perspective. And then really? when they were left over, that wasn't, that wasn't mine. When we, well, you know, when it was over, you went to the kitchen and was like, "Well, we ain't gonna waste this." So, so the <laughs> the way I was brought up, apparently, I was not a good kid. Was my parents and and the people in our church that I highly respected said, "This is a very serious thing. It's a very serious thing we do." And you got to make sure your heart's right because um, if it's not, because this is such a serious thing and so holy, um, look at Ananias and Sapphira. Right. <laughs> like, and, the, and our parents and I was didn't like, say that. I was but. scared to death to die. <laughs> so I was like, okay, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Don't kill me. <laughs> but, you know, but I think this is where, the, the, where it's fair to have the conversation, and this is right. where kind of the idea came up even in my head, is I've had students in, in my student ministry, um, one specifically – um, because of her family situation, she comes from a divorced home. Um, she's a teenager. Well, now she's a college student. She had a job, all these different things. She looked at me one time and goes, Mark, I haven't taken communion over a year and a half. Mm. And the reason is because of our church's calendar of how we do communion. We only do communion once a quarter. And then yeah. there's some churches that do it once every single week. There's some right. churches that do different kinds of elements. They have different importances. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be a good conversation for us to have, for, especially mm -hmm. for listeners who are either have grown up in the exact same style of faith they've always had, um, whether it's Protestantism, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's the Reformed view, Baptistic view, whatever. Um, and also those who are younger in the faith or just never had these conversations of, mm -hmm. A, you know, what is communion? But even bigger than that, this is why we're calling it a catechism because we're going to ask very specific questions to give very specific answers. And for people that don't know, catechism is like question, answer type style of learning. That's what it is. So that's what this is going to be. It's going to be a question and we're going to answer. A question, we're going to answer. A question, we're going to answer right. with the hopes of going, okay, what is communion? What's the purpose of communion? Why do we even take it as a church? And is there any really significance for it? Right. Like, do we put too much importance on it? Do we put not enough importance on it? Or have we been doing it wrong? Have our been entire doing life, it right. or have been doing correct? Like right. that's that's the thing. So to get into it, though, I think we need to take an even farther step back versus just what's communion, but right. step back and go, okay. So the church has these things. If you grow up in the Baptist church, it's called an ordinance. Mm -hmm. Catholic church, and I prefer this term, perfect personally, is the sacraments. I think why a lot of people don't like the term sacraments is just because it's got a bad connotation, right? Because the Catholics I mean, use the term sacraments. Well, not know? only that, it's just. Um, sacraments have been used in other religions too and mm. so that's i think people just that i think that's why most baptists don't like the term but well here I'm goes. Okay so, so so i have a definition for sacraments let's let's right? hear so, yep. because if we talk about the baptism or i'm sorry hello we're talking the about baptism. communion but baptism and communion are known in the protestant world as these are the two ordinances of the church they're the, they're the staples they're the staples of what makes the church so right. um so other what's than a Jesus. sacrament there you go. So what's a sacrament? This comes from J.I. Packer's Concise Theology book. By the way, I like J.I. Packer. He's I really do, really too. really good. Uh, I got a lot of this stuff also by one of my favorite, well, two favorite theologians. One is Grudem, mm. and then the other is Millard Erickson. I like mm. both of them, too. So mm. um, this comes from J.I. Packer's book called Concise Theology. And a sacrament is from the Latin word sacramentum, meaning holy rite in general and, in particular, a soldier's sacred oath of allegiance. Study of the rites themselves yield the concept of a sacrament as a ritual action instituted by Christ in which signs perceived through the senses set forth to us the grace of God in Christ and the blessings of his covenant. They, the sacraments, communicate, seal, and confirm possession of those, um, of those blessings to believers who by responsibly receiving the sacraments give expressions to their faith and allegiance to God. The effect of receiving the sacraments is quote-unquote, from the Westminster Confession, to put a visible difference between those that belong to the church and the rest of the world and solemnly engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his word. And then he continues the couple paragraphs later, and he says, as the preaching of the word makes the gospel audible, so the sacraments or the ordinances make it visible. 
And God stirs up faith by both means, by the preaching of the word and by the sacraments. So the idea is, is what he's trying to communicate, is that these are things that show our allegiance to Jesus. We're, when we're baptized into the faith, that's proclaiming to the world of what the message of the gospel is. And, and baptism is simply, I used to be one way and now I'm this way. Because mm-hmm. even the Jews baptized mm-hmm. back in the day. Well, well they, they called it something different. But. Right, right. But there was a, you're, you're basically renouncing what was and now you're turning to what is mm-hmm. over here for this. Um, almost like a ceremonial, ceremonial cleansing. It's, mm-hmm. it's a visual mm-hmm. representation of what's going on. And then communion is also a proclamation of what we believe and a reminder of ourselves, right? Reminder to ourselves of what we actually believe too. Yeah. There's a lot there. Well, I'm holding my comments until we go a little further. (laughs) (laughs) So basically, you know, a sacrament or, or, um, it might've been Calvin who said this. It might've been where, what are, what are the, the signs and the marks of a true church? And the reformer said, the preaching of God's word and the ordinances in the church, baptism and communion. That's it. Um, some churches would add foot washing into there and mm-hmm. the Catholics would add five more sacraments mm-hmm. into there of mm-hmm. what that actually means. But, but at the end of the day, specifically communion, it's a visual representation of the gospel made visible. Right. That's kind of the idea. So, so what is actually communion? Like, what is it? Where did it come from? Why do Christians actually do this? And I didn't bring all the verses here, but this is actually one of the quote unquote stories that's found in every single gospel. You know, you line up the gospels. There's sometimes, you know, Mark might have a story, but John doesn't, but Matthew tells it this way. I really thought a little different. I really thought you were going to bring it up to one of the gospel stories up to one of the verses, but I didn't, but, um, but basically the idea was at Passover, which can, but both elements actually represent things that were part of the Passover feast. Mm-hmm. So every single year Passover, in case you don't know the, the Old Testament Jewish history, Passover was when the Israelites were in Egypt, mm-hmm. and this was the last of the ten plagues where the, the Israelites went out, they put blood on the doorpost from an unspotted, unblemished young lamb, and the angel, and the of angel the Lord passed, passed over. over their house. <laughs> but they had to have their uh, shoes ready, they had to have their cloaks ready, they had to have their... Uh, Bread was cooked with unleavened yeast, which means they didn't have time to rise. Which is why they do that to the, even to this day. To this day, they celebrate the Passover mm-hmm. feast. And so Jesus was celebrating Passover feast with his disciples. disciples. And this is where it gets really fun and really interesting because Jesus was celebrating Passover, and he said, here's a new covenant I give to you using the same exact elements that are used in the Passover, where you have the um, bread, the which wine. represents the the the... The, the bread, I mean, he even, Jesus even calls it the bread of life. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what, there's a whole meaning behind everything that's done at a Passover table. Correct. Everything has a meaning, yep. and I don't remember what the actual bread and wine were, but he made well, it. Well, the bread was on. just the fact of, it was it's unleavened bread, because you have to be ready to go at any time, and you don't yeah, have to wait for it to cook. Right. And then the wine is what they drank. Yeah, but there was... But, a, but I think it also represented blood too with that i don't but, but either way so jesus took the bread and said this is my body which is broken mm-hmm. to you representative of the lamb passover right. lamb which jesus was the lamb like of, like a lamb led to the slaughter right the lamb this is my God. body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way he took the cup and said this is my blood which is shed for you which the blooding shedding of the, the blood shed of the lamb put over the, the 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 post, and then from all the years past up until Jesus, he said, do this remember to me too. In other words, Jesus is saying, you used to have a lamb. Mm-hmm. That's what made you be able to stand before a holy God. Now I'm the perfect lamb, right. both in body and in blood with that too. And so when Jesus made this, they, they put it in all the... Um, all the gospel, because that's how important this little message was. Right. And and this was where the foot washing was also instituted, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They had the meal together, and then they had the, the for that's why we call it the Lord's Supper, because that's what Jesus did. Um, but most pastors don't talk about those passages whenever they do the communion part of the service. Right. They always bring up the 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34. And that's where the Apostle Paul said, For I received this from the Lord, what I also deliver to you, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, and he took the bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, do this remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, which is interesting, he didn't do it at the same time. Just It was at a different point in the meal. He said, The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Mm. And then this is where Paul goes in, and this is where you were talking about the seriousness of communion, Mm -hmm. where he says, 
Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Oh, <laughs> like what? Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drink without discerning, truly, he would not be, oh, wait, oh, I skipped a lot. Discerning line. the body um, eats yeah, and yeah. drinks judgment on himself. Thank you. Um, First 30. I, I skipped you like did. a whole line of my notes. Um, this is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died mm-hmm. because you have misused, but this is my adding, because people misused it. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Mm. So then, my brothers, whenever you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about other things. I'll give those directions when I come. And so to kind of expound a little bit past this, why did Paul bring this up in 1 Corinthians? Well, I mean, what, what was the context before this? Uh, before it was there was a segregation between the rich and the poor, and there was a bunch of rich people that were, for lack of a better word, coming and getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, and then well, leaving the poor people out to eat, and they got nothing. Well, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. They were eating and getting drunk with wine, and not waiting on their fellow brothers, and then in fact, they left them outside because they're <laughs> versus the rich and the poor, right. and because they were wealthy and had all these different things. Right. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, this is. This verse or this passage specifically has caused the biggest dissension in the church, right? Because of the different interpretations of this is my body, this is my blood. That was the Martin Luther right. argument. That's a funny, com- a funny, funny, funny story. Um, but then also, um, whoever eats and drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty, guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So coming out of this verse, each for lack of a better word, is, is strain the right word? Um, each group? I don't know. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. But but each each group of people have interpreted this to be different ways. Yes. From Catholics to different views even inside of Protestantism. So historically, I do want to hit these views real quick, and then we'll explain why that even matters later. Right. Um, so segueing out of the verse, that's what the Bible says. That's all the Bible says about communion is Jesus did it. Here's why he did it. Here's what the Apostle Paul says about it. Other than that, we take it from there. Right. And there has been dissension ever since. So there are actually four primary views of communion in church world right now. One, I got the coffee burps, excuse me. Uh, the first <laughs> every one, week. <laughs> every week. The first one is called transubstantiation. Mm-hmm. This is the traditional Catholic view. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one is consubstantiation. Mm-hmm. This is more the Martin Luther and that strain of Lutheranism view. Right which they're very similar. The third one is the reformed view, which that because of, I mean, it's, it's still, this was John Calvin's view and it's not, it has nothing to do with predestination election. It's just, this is the premier reformer view Mm -hmm. of things. And then the fourth one is just called the memorial view, Mm -hmm. or some people know it as the Zwingli view because Ulrich Zwingli was the biggest proponent of the memorial. I've never never heard it called that, but that's, Oh, gotcha. Because I'm not as in, into that is <laughs> what, church, I, I'm kind of what I should be, history. what I should be. Yeah. But either way, so so let's break them down, and then we'll talk about why it matters with right. these different views. So going over these super quick, all right, this is going to be completely just our <laughs> rapid fire. Here we go. So if you want to read more about it, go to gotquestions.org, type these in. They'll explain it out if you miss anything, too, or, or if I miss anything, too. So I'll do and, my best. And always, it will be in the show notes. Just like always. Um, I don't make sure... That the, well, the link is always in the show notes, got right. questions.org too. So I'll make sure that there's specific links for each view in the show notes too. Right. So the first one is transubstantiation. This is a traditional Catholic view. And this is where the elements become the body and blood of Christ. In fact, they actually say there's an actual metaphysical change that we don't fully see, we don't fully understand. But when you partake, it's it actually, actually turning into flesh beca- and blood. Now it still stays bread. But it doesn't like all of a sudden in your some they've changed a little bit since the Council of Trent, right? But a lot of Orthodox Catholics, cause it becomes the body and blood group, of Christ. We, we group Catholicism all together, yeah. But there's, there's so many different, different views. Yeah. But in like the Orthodox Catholicism world, it's like no, as you like eat it and swallow it, it becomes the Christ's actual body, right? And it becomes his actual blood. Yeah, right. It's weird. Yeah. Because we but, call but it's that metaphysical. Can- so we call that ca- cannibalism. <laughs> that's, that's my joke too. I love it. But, um, but, but at the end of the day, it's the fact of, no, this actually becomes the, the, the mm-hmm. literal body and blood of Christ. But this is where it's interesting is 
the elements can only and will only be changed if properly or, or if, a, if a properly ordained priest blesses them and then administers the elements. Mm. So I was talking with a, a friend of mine, and they were saying that if if you're receiving communion at mass and a deacon gives you communion, because some of these churches are so so stinking huge, for you to get to the priest. No Whatever. way, no. Well, the communion still counts, but you don't get to receive an extra blessing from the because normally it's like bless you, my son, bless you, my daughter. Deacons can't minister that, right? So you can still partake of the elements, but if you want to wait for a blessing from the priest, you got to wait in line and go through the line after services. Other than it's, it's it's kind of interesting, but so the 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 elements can only it will only be actual transformed if the right person both blesses it and administers it, right? Um. And this is where a, the, a, a big conversation, I think, happens, too. And another one is the fact of that the, the mass itself is a sacrificial act. Mm-hmm. In other words, every single Sunday, they sacrifice Jesus again. That's, it's, a sacri- mm-hmm. it's, it's actually another sacrifice. Well, it's all based off of the tabernacle. I mean, yes, yep. they'll, they'll even say it themselves that yep. everything is based off of a symbol of the tabernacle or temple um, mm-hmm. that they believe is going to be in heaven. Right. So, so when, when you're actually partaking of Jesus's body and blood, he is being sacrificed. in a way re-sacrificed every single Sunday or mm-hmm. Saturday, if you go to Saturday mass, um, and the Eucharist has to be partaken every single week. In fact, mm-hmm. if you don't go to mass and receive it, you are dangering yourselves of a, um, of a venial sin, mm-hmm. not a, not a moral sin, but a sin where you could literally die and go, so, well, sorry, you 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 didn't receive communion, go to mass enough. So, right. so go to the penalty box, or just just get out. No, the penalty box is where you go and confess your sins. Right, exactly. One <laughs> thing when you die. So, but anyway, so with with communion, this is the another big difference between Catholics and Protestants is Catholics believe that there are seven sacraments. Mm-hmm. You know, the the they they call it the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, mm-hmm. uh, Holy Baptism, which is normally baptism when you're a baby to put you into the covenant of the church, or mm-hmm. if you're an adult convert. Mm-hmm. Um, confirmation is another one. Reconciliation, anointing of the sick, marriage, and holy orders, which is basically like last rites. Right. That's what holy orders is. So and basically— again, And again, to put it in layman's terms, sacraments is the pillars of, or the foundation of the faith to show the fruits, basically. Right, and it's the sealing of the believer. So right. if you are a Catholic and you are missing some of these you know, seven sacraments— that could actually set you up in the next life for not a good next life. Right. And that's why you always will see, even in movies and anything like that, where it's like, just read me my, my read me my last rites. And it's like, but you're you're not even Catholic. Well, just just to be sure. I want to make sure. Just in case. And that's not me making fun of the Catholic faith. I'm just right. saying this is people's mindset towards it of mm-hmm. I want to make sure I've had my last rites read to me. So mm-hmm. that way, in case I made any sins that I can't for confess. I'll be okay right. in the next life. Um, the next one, consubstantiation. This is the Luther's view, and the 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 funny way I was described as as a kid is to a to to Luther. They're different than different to Catholics, but from a like all the other Protestants were like, no, y'all pretty much the same thing, bro. Right. Like it's kind of hard to explain the difference because Luther says no, the body and blood doesn't literally become, but Jesus is he in, in direct quotes in with and under the elements, so it doesn't transform it but jesus is still there in the communion and this is the big fight he had with both zwingli and calvin where Mm -hmm. we could have even had a bigger protestant reformation but there was this hilarious story it's not wasn't hilarious back then where luther flipped over a table with a knife carved out the words this is my body and they they agreed on all the different tenets calvin zwingli and luther except this one right because luther still believed that there was way more to it like Jesus was actually there with the elements. It doesn't become his body because we don't resacrifice mm-hmm. Jesus every single Sunday. Because mm-hmm. Luther was the one where, you know, all the solas came from Martin Luther. Right. And Christ died once for all. Right. But we remember, don't have to resacrifice him every Sunday. But remember that Luther was a devout Catholic. Oh, one hundred percent. And never really wanted a separate sect. No, he was a he was a Puritan. The only reason why there's a Protestant movement is because he was excommunicated from the church. Right. He died a Catholic. That, that was what it was. Yeah. And he, he didn't want the Catholic Church to go away. He right. wanted to reform it. Reform right. the Catholic Church. Um, he, wasn't, well, he didn't want to be a dissenter. No. But they, in, in his words, you made me dissent. Right. Um, but when you literally call, I'm sorry, the, uh, the ass who sits upon St. Peter's throne, when you say that to the Pope, <laughs> you're going to get excommunicated. <laughs> that was a direct quote from Martin Luther. Like, the dude was crazy. So, 
Yeah. I think I just made our podcast explicit. So, well, he wasn't, he's not crazy. He was passionate. <laughs> oh, he was a little crazy too. Um, but, but so the, that's the big difference between the, right. the views. Um, but again, Luther says Jesus died once for all for our sins. You don't need to sacrifice him every single Sunday because his death that one time right. was enough. However, you still need to, part- to participate in every single week and every believer needs to do this. Does it change your place in salvation? No, but you will have a better Christian life if you take it. Mm-hmm. Kind of the idea. So the reform view, which I think is really interesting, is the fact of Christ is present not physically, but spiritually with the elements. Mm-hmm. In the way it's it was described, uh, I think, I don't know if Calvin described it this way or if someone else described it, one of the books I was reading. Um, it's kind of like the sun, right? Like the actual physical sun that the earth revolves around. The sun never moves in the same way that Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. However, when the sun's up, you feel its warmth. You can see the, the see everything around because of it. It lights everything there. You know the sun is here, but the sun's not here. The sun is somewhere else. And the same right. idea, that's the way the Reformed view takes it, where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. However, he's experienced through the communion mm-hmm. elements. Um, in fact, this is actually kind of interesting because it's still not just, oh, it's just we take it in remembrance of Jesus. It's the fact of, no, it actually, this, it's a sacrament that helps seal the believer. Mm. Um, uh, Lewis Burkhardt suggested that the Lord's Supper seals the love of Christ to believers, giving them assurance that all the promises of the covenant, because reforms are all about the covenant, covenantal community, that the covenant and the riches of the gospel are theirs by divine donation. So it goes back to, honestly, the reform view of salvation, too, where the fact of you're sealed in Jesus, but this is a reminder that you are sealed because of Jesus predestined and, and elected you. And reform, they take it every single week. And I find this really fascinating. I think this is actually really cool. Um, the I've, I've been to a, a couple of reform services, and certain pastors won't make an application to the sermon because the table is the application. So like the whole sermon, he'll preach the sermon and then bring the table into it of here's what we do. Here's our response. Here's mm. our response. Here's our response. But I think is actually really cool. And it actually, mm-hmm. it's not a, for lack of a better word, it's not a giving of grace. It's not a means of grace. However, it's a way f- as a reminder of. It's a remembrance of grace. In an experience of it too. Right. And so I think there's a really cool element when you think about it this way. Um, but most Baptists like us, we're a strict memorial view. In other words, this was again made popular by you. I always say it wrong, but you'll rich Zwingli. I would say Zwingli, right? But the first name is interesting. You'll rich, you'll rich or you'll you'll Rick. I think it's you'll Rick Zwingli. I don't know. Either way, so Zwingli. The idea basically is the fact of there's nothing special about the elements. It's just some. It's literally just some wine, some grape juice, or it's you know some crackers. It's bread. Now it the the elements are still important. However, it's just they we focus on do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus is not here with the elements. He's mm-hmm. not even here in spirit of the element. It's simply a proclamation to everyone. This is what I believe, and it's a reminder to us of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and that he'll come back and make all things new. So that's, there's no spiritual element at all to it. It's just a fact of it's a remembrance factor of what Jesus did for us. So where do you fall? Where do I fall in this? Are you a good Baptist? Um. In all honesty, I think, especially the Baptist I grew up in, um, I think Baptists are so scared to even get close to Catholicism mm. or mm-hmm. Lutheranism or the Reformed view. Or charis- charismatic. Because <laughs> Baptists are known as, what are y'all doing? Okay, we're going to go over there now. Like, yeah. That's what a Baptist, a Baptist are separatists yep. by nature. Yep. That's just what we are. Um, but I think because of that, we've lost a lot of the richness in mm. the communion. Like, you know, a lot of times, even me on staff, I'm guilty of this, of thinking, oh, shoot, we haven't done communion in a little bit. We probably should do that. Rather than thinking, you know, this is where the center of our worship lies, mm-hmm. as in Jesus, and this is a reminder mm-hmm. of it. So sometimes, and even mega churches, I've, I've heard they've struggled with this too, is if you don't do it every single week, you know, now it's like, okay, we do it on once a month. We do it once a quarter. We do it... On the special holidays, like we do at Christmas Eve and Good Friday. So if you miss those two services because you're traveling or vacation or whatever, you miss two out of the four communions. Right. And then if you're serving, you miss another one. Right. And then so it's you one a year. If might, you lucky. might get you the, the average person might get one a year. Don't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, but so um, I am honestly more on the reform view side, mm. where I think that there definitely is the, do this in remembrance of me. 
But when Jesus says, do this as often as you gather, do this as often as you eat or drink, do this mm. remembrance of me. So I think there's a lot more to it than just a simple in remembrance of me because Jesus said, he flat out says, um, basically even uh, Paul even said, this is why Catholics had this view of the fact of, don't you dare, don't you dare cross a line because this is the body and blood of our Lord we're talking about mm-hmm. here. Like, and that's why the Catholic Church for a long time the parishioners didn't even take communion because we can't trust you with the body and the blood of Jesus. Because if you spill it, you still spill Jesus and you wasted his blood. Right. They took or it too far. They took it so far where the fact of, you know what, as a, as a priest, I will take this on your behalf. Right. Because this is too sacred for yeah, you. You're not holy enough. Exactly. Exactly. Which is not right. Um, I also think it was like I was at a church once and they shared the same communion cup. And I'm like, I ain't doing that. Mm-mm, that's nasty. That's gross. Like, I don't want to get sick. So I'm not a germaphobe, but I'm not dumb. But, you know, but at the same token, <laughs> this is where I think the line is the fact of, we see this in the fact of the Lord's Supper should be a serious matter, but at the same token, it shouldn't be, I don't think, also just a somber matter either. I think it should also be a celebration matter too. Mm. So I actually love how the Brethren Church does it. Mm. The Brethren Church always does a love feast as a whole, not all churches, but as a whole, they're known for having a massive love feast. Like it's a, it's a Baptist potluck. And then from there, they have the, they have communion at the end but they also do foot washing in it too. I'm not, I'm not all about the foot washing. Yep. I'm not, but at the same token, I see the, 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 the value and submission of, in the intimacy that that brings of, I will stoop down and do something Humble, nasty to serve you. It's a humbleness. Um, in fact, the last church I was a part of, that was a, a core tenant of the men's ministry. I don't think it should be you a know? sacrament, but it's, it's definitely not a, sacrament. a good thing that could be done. Yeah. Right. So with these views, you know, I, I don't believe in transubstantiation. Um, and I don't know if we want to go into this right now of why we think some of these things are wrong. Um, but I, I don't believe in transportation at all Mm-mm. because for the, the, a, a couple different reasons. And, and the first is the fact of why do you feel like you need to sacrifice Jesus every single Sunday where we see in Hebrews, they sacrifice once for all what sacrifice. And like it says it in the Bible, right. Of in Jesus. And, and are you saying, so, so you need to sacrifice Jesus every single week for your I don't, I don't think the common recovery. Catholic person views it as sacrificing Christ every nope. single week. But that's the core of the doctrine. That's, I think it, that's, that, that's very what the mass, much so. That's, yes. that's what mass actually means. Right. It's very much so. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I disagree with that. And I think if you pressed most Catholics, they would disagree with that as well. But this is where I also disagree is because the way the Catholic church is set up is how do you receive salvation? We receive salvation through the blood of Jesus, but you basically this is how it is. Is Jesus opened the way with the sacrifice to Jesus, mm-hmm. but how do you get in through the church? Mm-hmm. Protestants say, uh-uh, it ain't the church that lets you in. Jesus is the one that lets us in individually. Right, because he, he's the only way, the truth, and the life. Exactly, whereas the Catholic Church says is, uh-uh, uh-uh, we're the gatekeepers. We say if well, you come or go. <clears throat> you have to realize, though, the way they look at it is the Pope is the mouthpiece of Christ. The vicar, the vicar yes. of Christ. Right, exactly. Um, so... To them, it's just a misguidedness. Mm. I think I really believe it is just a misguidedness. I believe, um, man, I believe there's so many good Catholics out there mm-hmm. um, that are just got some wrong doctrine, or haven't been taught, right? Or haven't studied, or have studied and just have wrong. I mean, we all like echo chambers, right? Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's true. We're gonna we're gonna be where we can hear the resounding echo of our our own beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's where they're at right now. And, um, it's very difficult. Uh, I belong to this group called, um, uh, apologists on Facebook and it's basically atheists and Catholics and Protestants all Wait, really all going at it through different threads. We, somebody poses a question and then we so all, it's a massive, you go at it thread. Yes. Uh, and every anybody uh, like Ooh, a lot of people stress yeah. me out. It, it, <laughs> that would stress me out. It gets so I, I read Ooh. I read a lot of the Catholic and they have a, they have a lot of good points and they have a lot of bad points. <laughs> and um, atheists atheists have some good points but a lot of bad points. Mm-hmm. And Protestants have a lot of good points and a lot of bad points. And it's like, man, we're all a little messed up here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. But but with yeah. the Catholic Church, it's one of those things where my standing with God is in direct reflection if if I take communion or right. not. Yeah. Yeah. And you I know? guess, you know, for me, you know, you said you, you fall under more of the reformed. I'm kind of somewhere in between reformed and uh, consubstantiation. Oh, really? I'm kind of in the in between there, more towards the reform. Um, but there's something is super sacred. 
I believe, about taking communion. And I believe there is somewhat of a spiritual aspect to it. Now, am I saying Christ is in it, the elements spiritually? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying there is a spiritual, there's a reason why we're supposed to judge ourselves before we take it. Mm. There's a reason why the Corinthians were ill and sick because they weren't judging themselves before they take it. There's a spiritual aspect there. So that's why I say I fall between those two, but closer to the reform side. I'm not like Luther, I think, is kind of crazy with it. But right. Um, yeah, I kind of fall, fall a little bit between those two. But I also don't think the, the memorial view is necessarily wrong. No, I don't you know? think so. I, I, think it's, I think you could take the memorial view and the reformed view and combine them together and then a little bit of the consubstantiation, a little bit, maybe like 10% of it. And if you tied that all together, you'd probably be pretty close to what it actually is. <laughs> right. So, so here's the question then. And this is why someone might be thinking, okay, cool. These are the different views, whatever. Like this is what my church does. Does it really matter? But at the end of the day, why does it matter? And a couple of questions I thought of is one is, do we receive grace or salvation through this act? Or is it simply just a reminder? It is not grace nor salvation because grace is given freely. I just lost my microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Retighten the hatches a little bit. Batten down the hatchets, come. Yep, my mic fell. <laughs> um, we joked about money for a new computer. We might need new mic stands, too. <laughs> we need a studio. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so if anybody's got an extra space, no. Um, no, I lost where I was going with it all. <laughs> yeah, because I lost my microphone. Um, it's not um, a means of salvation or grace. Right, yeah. So it's not, we know that grace is a gift. It's nothing we do. So if if this was something that, caused salvation or grace mm -hmm. right then we're having to do something but you can't you can't receive grace that way or salvation because it's all a gift from god um we just say oh, i surrender <laughs> we give up that's all we do mm -hmm. we just give up um it is a reminder but it's more than a reminder so i think it's a uh, not so much, but yes, kind of. But do you but think this is supposed it. to be a somber time? Because I, like, I think of the church, every church I've ever been a part of is they have the like the music playing, and there's mm -hmm. also, after the elements are passed out, the music stops, and it's dead quiet. The exam, and then, but the preacher always says, take this time to examine yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them do it because of the first Corinthians passage. Mm -hmm. it says to. You know, that's what Paul tells the Corinthians to do. Um, it, it is. It's a time. We, well, one, we're supposed to reflect and self-examine every single day. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to do that. Um, we don't always do that. So this is, again, another reminder, and I'm glad pastors do it to, hey, this is a serious thing. It, it brings the somberness of the seriousness of what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. And if your heart is not right, it's better that you don't take it. Um, and I think, in my opinion, I think, like here at Southside, I can say here at Southside because we're, we're legitimately here, here at Southside. <laughs> here at Southside, um, I wish we would do it every week. Mm. And I don't think it has to be something that... So I'll give you an example. I was at Riverside Church, right? Yeah, that's the church Fun I fact, I live right by the church. You do. I didn't realize that until yes, the other do. day. Right down the road. Literally, two miles. Um, so when I was at the church, we, we did the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we did it every week, but we had a table, like two tables off to the side with the elements on it, right? Okay. And the pastor, Pastor Keith Balaka, um, would say something along the lines of, you know, he'd, he'd tie in the sermon with the Lord's Supper and, and importance just about every week. And he would say, um, time to do, you know, kind of like what Scott does, time to do business with God, like type right, of yep. thing. Um, and then he would say, as often as we come together, we should do this in the remembrance of Christ. Um, take time. If you feel led, the elements are up here. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't make it. The thing I hate about passing out and only doing it like quarterly like we do here is that you're passing around the tray. And you could see that people look. They're like, all right, is so-and-so going to take it? So, -and -so. so it's like mm. rather than, okay, look, we're doing a worship time. If you want to take the elements, they're up here. Like, And we have it out and available every week. And that way people can come up, they can, you know, self-examine, they can go do, do business with God, and then if they would like to take the elements, they can't. Um, and I really appreciated that. And another thing, I, I, th I think we both agree, it's super, super important. Mm -hmm. It's super important. We're supposed to do, as often as we meet, we should do this in remembrance of him. And 
I think that one time a year, realistically, or twice a year, like we have here at Southside, of actually being able, if you don't get to everything or if you're, uh, you know, serving or something like that, um, that you're really only getting it once or twice a year. I think it's sad. I really think that we miss out on a lot. So do you think, in all honesty, have we lost out on the sacredness? Out of response, we don't want to be like the Catholics. We don't want to be like the Reformers. We don't want to be like the Lutherans. Have we swung so far in the other direction where, I mean, it's almost like the, like, let's, all right, church, let's refocus back in. And it's almost like the idea of like, Whatever the which way cultures go, and the church wants to make sure we're the opposite way. I think it, I think we have lost it because we don't want to be like that. It's it's sacred. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it reminds. What were the promises that he gave prior to that? What were the promises that we gave? I will not drink this cup again until I'm with you. And it's so such a beautiful thing that can happen. And actually, for a while with COVID, when we weren't, we were just doing church online. There was no church. It was mm-hmm. just all church online. Um, I actually bought bread and grape juice, and we started doing communion at my at home, just just uh, me and Janiel, um, because I believe it's that important, mm-hmm. and uh, it's something that I think the church has lost the beauty in it. Mm. And it's not like beauty, like oh, it's so spiritual, and we're looking for this feeling. It's not that. That's not the beauty I'm talking about. It's a beauty of remembrance. So, and because let's be honest, you know, in a world full of distractions and things that take us off our our minds and hearts off Jesus. Is this the purpose of the Sunday morning gathering? Mm. Is to come back together, to come to to to, to edify, encourage, to build up one another in, in all things in truth and love. Is this supposed to be a part of that? Mm. Well, what's the most edifying thing that we can do for each other? Coffee shops. That besides that. Oh, <laughs> uh, pray for one another. Okay, but all I, an edification, not just a praying. An edification to me, what would what's better than reminding each other that, hey, the promises of God are true and that we are going to be with him. And he's here with us now in spirit, but we will be with him for eternity. And that's why we take this bread and this cup in remembrance of that mm-hmm. and of the promises he gave. He went to prepare a place for us, right? That's that old... Uh, that old time uh, wedding ceremony, you know, the grooms in, in the, the weddings of Galilee back mm. in those days. Okay. Would have, uh, you know, after the engagement, and the engagement was the agreements between the two fathers, um, and the bride bridal p- price was paid. And just think of this as kind of a type of shadow as like Christ paid the bridal price mm-hmm. for us. Um, and then after that, he would immediately go to his father's house and build an apartment. Right? This is this was standard tradition. This is why Jesus used this analogy with his disciples because they were from Galilee and they would have understood this. And so, and then he goes, Christ goes and. Uh, of the hour and the day, no one knows but the Father, right? We see this in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mm-hmm. And uh, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the wedding model, the ancient Hebrew wedding model, um, there there was only one person that could say, it's time for a wedding, and that was the father of the groom. So the father of the groom would inspect the apartment that the son was building on for him and his bride. Hmm. And when the when the— Did you learn this in The Chosen? I did not know, actually, I, I, it's from other studies that I've done uh, this past year. And so uh, there's actually a great, I'm trying to remember, I think it's called Before the Before the Wrath, I think is what it's called. It's a, it's something on Amazon Prime yeah. that kind of goes, it, that's what got me started. Me, Janiel found it, it's a documentary, and we watched it, and I was like, oh, I love this, and so I dug really far into it. <laughs> but, but, anyways, but anyways, so the father would inspect the house. So the father would inspect the um would inspect the this apartment, this house that they were building on to the family house at his father's house. And only the father could say when they, that house was done and ready and say, go get your bride. Only the father. And so the bride and the groom never knew. And so what was the bride's job during this whole time? She had to continually get up every day and prepare herself as if it were her wedding day, adorn herself, really? get herself ready, and wait her and her handmaiden or bridesmaid or whatever you want to call them, um, and they would watch for the groom. And no one knew the hour or the day or the time of when the father would tell the groom to go get his bride. But when that happened, here's the cool thing. So we see like trumpets and stuff. We hear about the stuff in Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in that time, they would basically do a parade through the streets on his way to go get his bride blowing trumpets and singing songs and like it's, it's just a party it's a big here. grandeur thing 
And I believe this is what Christ is talking about when he comes back. He's going to come back for the church. This is a lot of the language he used in the Olivet Discourse um, and and what Paul uses and, and a lot of the and, and Thessalonians. A lot of this has to do with the, the thought process of what it was like in, in ancient, ancient Israel and the way weddings around that area were, were done. Hmm. It's just very fat. It was, oh man, it was so cool. <laughs> it was like seeing all the correlations and, and looking at the history. Of because it. we're, we're Western. We have no white idea. Americans who yeah, don't. We're like, Hey, we're going to get engaged. And like the engagement, like we see this with Mary and Joseph, they, they were married. They just hadn't consummated. Legally, they were married. That's why Joseph when he found out Mary was pregnant before the angel came and told him, hey, <laughs> you better marry Mary. <laughs> but he was all about uh, giving her a written divorce. It talks about a written divorce. And putting her away quietly so she wouldn't be stoned. Right. So because they were legally bound together, they were legally married, they just had not consummated. The consummation process hadn't taken place yet. So it's way different than what it is nowadays. Like for for for, for me and Beth, for you and Beth, your engagement was we're engaged. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's all it is. That's what it is. And and that now we're preparing to be married in the engagement. Right. But how but, many how many people throughout America have been engaged and broken it off? Right. <laughs> and let's be honest. Um, Beth is the one who bought the house that we're moving into because I'm selling my house. She's so your, she's your sugar she, mama. <laughs> she's, she's the the groom. She's the she's the groom and the father. <laughs> <laughs> she she'd like that. She's telling you when the wedding's gonna be and where. <laughs> That's the way most dudes are. So you know. Anyway, sorry that was a no, big rabbit was, trail. But it, at the same token, though, it helps us see. Okay, so if we're supposed to be looking forward to this, what can we do to prepare ourselves and right. get ready for? In the world full of distractions and hate and and sorrow and jobs and kids and sports and fun and entertainment and just friends and just honestly, this is gonna sound weird, but doing the church thing, right? is this the time where we can come together and slow down and reflect and remember that mm. Jesus is still real? Mm-hmm. His, it's yes. why I like to reform you, the fact of he's still on his throne, but right. we are partaking with Christ in this. Right. And it's a promise. Right. It's a promise. Mm. Like, that's the huge thing. And and there was something about, so the in the ancient Hebrew wedding models type stuff, there is a, the groom always gave a gift to the bride as a remembrance thing. And they would actually drink drink a cup of wine together. And then they would not drink together until he went and got them. So, that, again, it points back to this. Really? Whole thing. Oh, yeah. And so it's like there was a gift. There was this drinking of the wine when they agreed upon the marriage. And then he fathers, bounced to go build his house. And he, they didn't see each other again until his father told him to go and get his bride. And, see, and this is stuff that just reading the Bible, we would not know. Mm-mm. Now, you have to understand the culture back then. And so, you know, we study you got to study some of the old culture and and how the culture is now and i mean it's it's amazing stuff that's cool well, hey before we quit though i know we're yeah, really sorry. close to the hour mark oh, i got boy. four random questions and i don't want to take too long on them all right I'll be but quick. these are questions that teenagers have asked me i've asked pastors and i think would be questions that certain people have asked and i think it would be lazy for us not to ask and answer these questions because some are fun, but some are not. So I'm going to ask these four questions, okay. and we're going to try to keep it short. So we've answered okay. some of them a little bit. Like We've already let let out our views a little bit. Right. But let's, let's, let's answer them specifically. So do the elements in communion actually matter? Does it actually need to be unleavened bread, and does it actually need to be – I'm not going to say wine, or but just fruit of the vine. Yes and no. Okay. Yes, because Christ did it and said, do this in remembrance of me. Right. And no, because I don't think he – the the point of it was not unleavened bread and wine, grape juice, fruit of the vine. It was, this is my promise. Do the promise in remembrance of me. Do what I'm doing mm-hmm. to remember me. And I think, it's, so I think it's a yes and no. I think it's both. And so, yeah, that's And I've opinion. heard people like uh, specific Pastor Scott, when he was down in um, Ecuador, he was at a place when they were going to take communion, and they didn't have they, they they didn't have access to any of this. Right. So they they got what they could to right. do the best that they could. And they said, right. you know what, this is not the ideal. This is not what it's supposed to be. But this is what we're going to do because we still want to part. Like we 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 want to come together and focus on what Christ did for us. Right. But at the same token, I'm one where it's like, yeah, the elements kind of do. They, matter. That's what. Yeah, they do. They don't. I mean, if you can't do them, then do what you have. I think that's what Christ would say. Okay. Now this is another big, give your best. This is another big difference between memorial view, the reform. And I'm going to put Luther view and the Catholic view. It doesn't matter who gives the communion elements. Does it matter? Does it have to be an ordained priest? I say no, no, 
I don't think so. I don't think that um, the disciples at the time were not ordained ministers when he did it to them. Mm. Um, I think that when Christ comes and fills you, he kind of does does that. He the kind priesthood of, like, of all believers. That's part of the there's a reason why we are called the temple, right? right. No, so we are called priests of our home. We're called, you know, we're called these things of, as men of God, and so because we don't worship God in a place, but we worship in spirit. I and think truth. it's I think it's important as the leaders of our home that, in my opinion, right or wrong, my opinion being the roles that men are in. I think men should administer and be like, hey. I'm going to pray over this, and then we're going to do it together. And it's not a it's not and a it's leadership; not, it's a serving role. It right. It it's a it's a role. That's why I didn't say it was a authority. It's a role. All right. I think the men as leaders of the home should take on this role of servitude. Mm. So, because so how, in the church, would you like to see the father go get the elements and bring them back to their family? I I I That'd think dope. that'd be pretty sweet. I think that if not that. The father should at least take his family up and get it and pass it to his family. Mm. I think it's a very important thing, and I think it strengthens the family. So I experienced two different things, and I thought this was super cool. Um, And this is more the, for lack of a better word, millennial Protestant liturgical style. Is um, We were the the church plant that we served at, Grace Story Church. They did communion every single week. They Mm. actually used wine, so I had to tell the teens, don't drink. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get you in trouble. I don't want to get fired, so just don't. Um, and then the bread. But what they did is they actually had a family stand up there with the bread and another family with the with the the wine. And they said that this is Jesus' body that was broken for you. This is Jesus' blood that was shed for you. They said mm-hmm. that to every single person. And mm-hmm. the person changed every single time, every single week. Right. And then on that same mission trip, we actually partook communion as a part of the mission trip. And um, at, at the time, my now ex-wife, we stood up there with the, with the bread and with the the wine, well, grape juice. And we did the same thing. Right. And we were able to, and I'm like, that was one of the most beautiful things. And they, oh, I have a, I have a sneeze. Oh, boy. Oh. So while he's sneezing, he, he's got a mute here. I'll just talk so you guys maybe don't Ooh. hear it as bad. <laughs> <laughs> I sneeze. But, you know, it was a Rona. super, and it was an amazing experience to, to actually look the team dead in the eye and say, this was Jesus' body that's broken for you. And I said right. every single first name. So I said, this is body that's broken for you, Eli. Right. Jagger, this was broken for you. Cassidy, this is broken for you. Naya, this was broken for you. And it was not just a, a super cool, intimate experience for them with Jesus, but they would look me dead in the eye, and you would see this sign of that th- there's something special here. Yeah, you know? and and that's cool. I think that we should be careful not to make it repetitive, right? Because repetitive can lose the essence of it as right. well. And so, and that's very different from what they were used right, to. So and it was very gorgeous. different from what you were used to. Oh heavens! And yeah. So and so it, that's where it's cool. But I think if like you did it every week. Every single week, I think it'd be boop, boop. like okay, whatever, and it wouldn't have the same powerful impact, right? But I think it does still have an impact when the family does it, when the, right. the head of the household goes and says, "I am going to serve my." So family. when we rotate into the next question, then is does it matter where we take it? Because I know there's a lot of people with these different opinions of it can be only taken during a worship service, it, but do you think it'd be done in a small group at home? So you you anywhere? know you know I differ a lot from your opinion on church and what right. church yep. is. And so my, my thing is where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. That is the church. We are the church. It's not a building. It's not a place. So I think if we're coming together, I think it can be done anywhere. Me and my wife did it at home. It was just two of us. Mm-hmm. We did it. I administered. I said, listen, let's, let's, she wanted to do communion. I really wanted to do communion. Let's pray. We prayed. We read the scripture together. And then... And we took communion. We took our alone time, self-reflection time, and we took communion. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. And I, I think that it can be done. Now, it has to be done for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it can't just be a show of things. Obviously, we know that there's, there's – you can't say a blanket statement of, hey, this – yep, you can do it wherever. I can't go to a bar and do it. <laughs> like, right. You know what I mean? But in the right – in the right atmosphere, in the right place, with the right people, I think it can be. Mm. So, like, if our small group decided to take communion, mm. you'd be like, bet, let's go. Yeah, I'd be all for and it. And this is something I've actually have struggled with, specifically with, with Beth and I getting married. Right. Someone has asked, hey, are you going to do communion? And for me, I'm like, that's not the right time or place. Even though a lot of yeah. people are like, but that shows the, the story of the gospel and for those who were right. there. But, but not everybody is typically and we're, on weddings. A, a wedding, we're not there to worship God. We're, well, we're there 
to you're committing yourself not only to each other but to God in your marriage. Right. So it, it is a worship type thing, but it's not right. Like I, I'm, I'm actually hairy. one where I don't like communion as a part of the wedding ceremony, and that was like yeah. from like someone asked him like, "No, we're not doing it." That's like, but that well, why? And I said, "Well, this is why." And I explained part, my reason. Part of that is because you're a Baptist, and it's I'm a Baptist, and that's, and that's Catholic, part of it, and that's what Catholics do. <laughs> well, not so much of that, but the fact of and, and so for me, like, what's the purpose of communion? Like, I've actually struggled with I, I as a youth pastor specifically. It's one thing to do it on a on a retreat with another church where we're it's it's designed to be that, but I'm like, okay, should the youth group itself like down the student ministry space, should we partake communion? Or is that we need to do this with the bigger body, right? Not in groups, but we need to do this as the larger body. And this, again, goes to the question of what's your definition of the church and the gathering of the so, saints and all these different again, things. So, again, it goes to situation and environment. Mm-hmm. So you have a bigger body together. I think you do it with the bigger body and not as a cell group. And that's what I But do. in a small group on a separate night, I think it's okay to do then. So again, it's situational. Like I can't. That's why I don't say a blanket statement. Right. And and, a, and and again, for the student ministry context, I chose we're not going we're right. not going to do it. I said right. because I want, and I even told the team. I said, I know some of you want to do this. We're not going to because I said we're part of the bigger body. Right. And we're going to do this with the bigger. And when body. the bigger body meets, you do it with the body. Right. And that's where the struggle came to. I know as a small group that we actually. I remember this. This is a completely random rabbit trail. Pastor Scott came to our small group that one night, and he said, "I want to hear from you guys. You guys are the millennials. You guys are oh, here. The I kids. forgot about that. What are what are things that that your generation is? And, and this isn't a to serve the millennials. This was just the fact if he 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 did this with every every Sunday school. He went and met with everybody. Yeah, it was just the fact that one of our things was we want more. We communion. want communion. We want communion. No more, like no less than once a month. Right. And Soche, homeboy is the most reformed as reformed as they gets in this church. I know, he's struggling. Homeboy's <laughs> going, homeboy, he wants it like, tw- like, you know. I want it once a week. That's what I want. Home- I, I want it every Sunday. He wants it before service and after service. Like, I'm good with Soche. that too. So, but, and, and I'm that way as, as well, except for the fact of, man, that's a lot of coordinating. That's a lot of bacon bread. So, but at the end of the day, you know, we don't this bake is, no bread. We buy it in the little containers. No, from. no. Well, now we do, but now, but the, we actually bake unleavened bread. So our admin assistant Stephanie, she loves doing it. So she bakes the bread, but that not we anymore. Do. Not because of COVID. Yeah. Not because of COVID. So I'm saying we're buying it now. So now it's easy to yep. do. So, and, and I think that's a question that we have to ask. And like, that's a small group for me. I would, th- that's more the fact of, I don't see it being wrong, but personally I'm a little uncomfortable with it. Mm. Cause again, I'm like part of the bigger body. Where's the body? But then you can argue, okay, well, our church is part of the bigger body of South Bend, so does all the church in South Bend need right. to show up? Like, right. at what level are you going to stop? Right. You know, and I think that comes down to asking we're, the question We're the bigger why. body of the world, so we got to wait for the whole all Christians in the world to get that. I mean, so. And here's the last fun question. This is the preference question. This is right. n- nothing to do with orthodoxy. Nothing to do with the Bible, and except maybe it does. But should, <laughs> you like that transition? It doesn't, but maybe it should does. Should communion be taken at the end of a service with a little bit of juice and a little cracker, or should it be an actual feast? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Just what's with you. Yes and no. <laughs> See you guys later. Um, I think in an ideal situation, this is where the small group thing, I think it'd be good for the meal because you get the communion with each other, the fellowship with each other, and then you're doing it as a smaller body, but a body mm-hmm. of of doing the communion together and it, it draws a bond with each other closer but it's not always ideal and you can't always do a meal with a large group body like we have at Southside when we meet together as a larger group and so at that point I think it's okay to do the service I think it's yes and yes hmm. yes and yes situational that's my opinion I like it so I wish we would do it with large meals more often I do too like how dope would it be in all honesty how how awesome would it be if we're like the church, like, let's say we're having a, what's well, a little different now because of COVID, obviously, but let's say after church we have a meal, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, Pastor Scott says, all right, you know, the church, we would gather, The this is the same thing Jesus did, so I think this is a fair time to, let's 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 remember why we're here. We're here mm-hmm. to, we're only here for one reason. This, this body is gathered together because of Jesus, so let's right. remember them together. Like, how dope would that be? So when I was in I house church, we're cool. when I was in house church, we did communion every week, and we always did a meal. So we'd do it either before or after the meal or during our service or whatever. But we'd always do communion, but we'd always eat a meal because it, it drew that bond together. And it was really fascinating. And, and, and awesome. I think this might be another interesting conversation that we have. In fact, ooh, remind me to put this in my own personal notes. I know someone who wrote a book about worshiping around the table. 
Mm. And and I think I know a connection to get that person, and, and they have a really big, big follow. I think it'd be super cool to try to get them on. You know what we need to do? We need to go down to Twickingham and get an Orthodox Jew and come and bring them in for Passover that talk. so cool. That's what we need to do. Because they worship, like their Passover, it is a form of worship for them. That would be so cool. Shabbat is a form of worship for them. I think it'd be so cool to get somebody in here, an Orthodox Jew, just to discuss it. Just ask, like we just ask the question. Just, just ask the question, no opinions, just let him. That'd be super yeah. dope. That'd be super dope, super dope. Um, or if any of our listeners know anybody that's an Orthodox Jew, or even a Messianic like to, Jew, yeah, or Messianic, you know, that'd be super cool too. That would like to uh, share their story and share beliefs and why they do what they do. Would love to have them and ask questions. I love it. So, so anyways, so here's the, the 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 way I think we should land, end this conversation. Land the plane. Let's, let's land the plane. So this whole view of of, of communion, there's four primary views. Uh, the, for lack of a better word, Catholic view, Lutheran view. Uh, Reform view, Baptist view, those are kind of the main four. How do we know which one is the correct way? And does it really matter which way is the correct way? Let's just end it here. Mm. I think there is a right way and there's a wrong way. Okay. I think that there's two extremes. We have the Catholic extreme and the Baptist extreme, right? Because mm-hmm. they're on opposite ends of the, the spectrum. Um, I think that the Catholic version, um, they've almost made it idol worship out of the sacraments. And um, I think it's very dangerous um, to put it into a, this is actual, you know, transubstantiation of where it's being transformed. I think it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that having more of the Baptist or the memorial view is also likewise could be dangerous of you don't um, take seriously how serious communion is mm-hmm. or supper is and so there's two ends of the spectrum where you're overboard with it and have made an aisle or you're under underboard underboard no that's not the right i, word. I, I know what you you're know saying what you but like overboard where the fact of like every crumb cannot be wasted like you like right like, like, like i know like some only, churches have the only, they, they make sure every little scrum is only the priest can you know distribute it you know, after he blesses it this and is you the overboard it's, it's become an idol at that point because that wasn't what it was about it was about a remembrance of christ's promise to us not receiving any promise but remembering the promise remembering the promise he already gave the promise so it's remembering that promise and then you have the memorial which is like Eh, it's the Lord's Supper. Yep, I remember. Whatever. Like, there's a lack of luster. Choo choo, shot, shot, call right. it a day. Right. Yeah. So I think they don't take serious the gravity of what the Lord's Supper actually is. Mm. So that's my opinion. I like it. And coming out of it, being specifically a Baptist pastor, again, I think we've lost the the beauty of it for being scared of it being too liturgical. Yeah. And yeah. Not, right. I, I don't want to even just say Catholic y, but I want to say high church. Yeah. You know, we're so low church, like, you know, the high church and the low church, we have a lot of differences in separation, but I think there's a lot of beauty. This isn't tradition. There's a lot of beauty in the sacred. There's a lot. In we the could, sacramental. There's you know? a lot we could learn from Catholics and a lot the Catholics could learn from us, mm-hmm. I think. But it all comes back to is where does your salvation rest? If, if your salvation is in your baptism and in taking communion right. and other things that external factors give whether i mean but again this even goes to reform view this goes to the baptist view like there's so many baptists go oh, i attend church i give my money i do all these different things but it's like yo you're the worst karen i've ever seen like, can't say that anymore that's true that's true because <laughs> i'm a freelance graphic designer markite.com so <laughs> wow did you just plug yourself in uh, not sponsored wow. so yes i did you are sponsored that's true that's true <laughs> we, so, we pay you in coffee that's true so um but no, but but at the end of the day, you know, it's the fact of where does your salvation rest? And I love what Luther said, where Christ already died once for all. So mm-hmm. this has nothing to do with salvation. Right. This has everything to do with going back to sanctification and looking forward to glorification, which we didn't talk about much, but the fact of when our bodies will be restored and, and God's glory will be here and we will be in our forever glorified state. Right. So as Christians, I think we, yeah, just like you said, we need to have a higher view of it, but not so high where that's where salvation rests. Because right. we ain't need to sacrifice Jesus every single week. Nope. He's already sacrificed himself once. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The fact of it actually transforming into the physical body, that's just some weird philosophy. Like, that's not biblical. Uh, but I do think even Luther, the in with under, is th- 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 there's, some cre- there's some credence to that. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's the fact of what is the heart behind walking into it. Right. And what are you expecting out of it? I right. think those are the big two questions. Mm-hmm. That's all I got, dude. 
That was I had a long one. conversation, but hey, before we get into the fun facts with Fuller, we know we we say this every oh. single week. We want you guys to be able to actually come back and talk with us about this one. And I think this is one that's very different with different Protestant views. So on Facebook and on Instagram specifically, we put the posts every single week. We always drop a quote about whatever we talked about during that week too. I want you guys to hit us up and comment under stuff, man. We actually want to have the dialogue and the conversation, you we know? Feel, we feel so lonely out here in podcast land. Like when someone sends us a message on Facebook, oh, you're, you're on it fast. I get excited. When people DM me on Instagram, I respond to it fast. Even like, when we, we get try. emails, I try to get to it right away, and it's like, oh, I, I love conversating with, with listeners. We do. I, I do too, but I, I'm, I'm, I converse with seven little people all the time, so well, I, got, I don't always get to it. I got three and a wife and... Everything else I got to converse with too. So that's true. And that's people true. I got to work with. At least you're freelanced, which means I can be interrupted <laughs> at any part of the day. But either way, we want to continue the conversation with you guys. Yeah. So if you have thoughts, maybe we missed something. Maybe you have a question. Maybe you have a viewpoint that we maybe maybe we, we misspoke and we misinterpreted something. Let us know in the comments. Send us an email. We want to keep having the conversation going. But Fuller, you ready for the best part of RTC? Let's go. Time for. Fun facts with <laughs> <laughs> So I have to admit that I I happened to, I, I didn't put enough spaces between the end of the it's notes okay. and the fun facts. So it's I right. know what the fun fact is, but you know Fuller, what? it's okay because the fun fact of today actually takes place. This episode's going to air. I believe post Easter. Oh, so we're so, talking Easter a little bit for the talking, fun fact. We're talking a little Easter. So, All right. so get it to Mark, me, you already friend. know, but uh, listeners, <laughs> listener base, did you know that plastic Easter eggs and plaster Easter grass, plaster, plastic Easter grass were invented by a man who holds more patents than Thomas Edison? What? If you've ever enjoyed an Easter basket, basket with plastic eggs and grass, then you can thank Donald Wetter, the man who invented both. Wetter not only holds the patents on these holiday staples, he also holds a total of 1,413 U.S. patents, including ones for the water-based inks, inks, flower pot covers, and decorative wrappers. This compared to Thomas Edison, who held just 1,093 U.S. patents. So that's dude, ridiculous. Dude had over 300 more patents than Edison. And that's 300 more than you or me combined. That's that's. 1,413 more than you. <laughs> how, how is your brain where it's like, I'm just going to invent some stuff. You know what? I'm a little, I'm a little frisky today. We're just going to go. Uh, there just we think go. about it. Think you. about it. Like, like, okay, so let's say you invent over the course of 50 years. That's, a That's lot. Well, 20 per year? Two per month? More than, is that right? More than that. Well, for just, a thousand, just for 1,000. Just for 1,000. But 50, still, 50, if, you're, if you're kicking out two patents per see. month, now, I mean, obviously, some patents are predicated upon other patents. So you're, you know? you're kicking out 28 patents, 28 and a quarter patents a year over 50 That's years. ridiculous. And I don't even know how old he was or how long he was doing it. So it could have been less than that, which means more patents per year. That's re that's nuts. Uh, now, so, I mean, okay, like I'm looking at a pop can over there. You know, there's like 10 things that are patented in a pop can, you know? Yeah, the label. So the you can, can have the all top, these different things, but right. still. 1,413 U.S. patents that's, that's by Donald Weeder. Wetter? Wetter. Wetter. So we have Donald Wetter to thank for our Easter festivities with the eggs and the grass and all that fun Thank jazz. you very much, Wetter. We love it. <laughs> well, hey, guys, just like always, we're thankful you're with us here at RTC. We say this every single week, but go to the website, realtalkchristianpodcast.com. That's where you can literally find everything, the social media handles, the entire database of every single episode we have ever released. We have well over 80 hours of RTC content for you guys. We mentioned this the last few weeks, but we would love to start the blog as well. If you have a topic you would love to talk about, just write the topic, write us a blog post. I mean, it can be anywhere from 500 words to 1,000 words. We'll read it and we'll figure it out. We'll and, read it, format it, and put and it on. Put it on there. We would love to keep developing the RTC community and just a way to keep blessing the socks off of everybody. But go to the website. You can find everything there. Find the merch link there as well. That's all I got, man. A phone number's there as well and the email. Yeah. But hey, so until next time, guys. Take it easy. <laughs> <laughs>